Um, the first thing I want to tell you today is obviously you can tell that it looks a little different in here. We have lights and there's a microphone over there. Um, the reason is that they're filming this particular lecture. Um, so if at the end when we have a question and answer time, if you have a question that you would like to ask, if you'll just come up to this microphone here and ask the question so that we'll be able to pick it up on the tape. We would appreciate that. Uh, the, the center itself is, is doing the filming. Okay, uh, Tony Kiss is the longtime entertainment editor and beer writer for the Asheville Citizen Times. He's been writing and reporting on entertainment news here since 1984 and began following the craft brewing scene in 1994 with the opening of the Highland Brewing Company, the city's first brewery. Bumpkin County now has 10 craft breweries with more coming, including two big ones, Sierra Nevada Brewing and New Belgian Brewing. Tony grew up in the newspaper business, went to journalism school at East Tennessee State University in Johnson City, and then worked for his hometown newspaper, the Kingsport Time News. He spent five years covering crime in Anderson, South Carolina, before escaping to Asheville, <laughs> where he is hi was hired to report on entertainment for the Citizen Times. He and his wife now live in West Asheville. Now that be, gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Tony Kiss. Well, thanks. Um, you know, that is my job. I write about beer. A lot of, of what I do is to write about beer, and I also report on entertainment. People say, that's the coolest job in Asheville. And, you know, I'm not going to disagree with them. It is a pretty cool job. And when I came up here in 1984, if any of you all have been around here for quite a while, you remember Asheville was a quite different place in, in the 1980s, and downtown was pretty dead, and there very, weren't very many restaurants, and certainly weren't very many bars or entertainment venues in downtown. But it's changed a lot for the better, and um, one of the big changes is uh, Asheville's transformation from um, you know, tourist town to beer town. And people are always asking me, like, what happened? How did it, how did it get going? And, it, it was kind of a multi-step process, uh, but the first brewery in Western North Carolina and the first beer stories I wrote about uh, were in 1993, but not in Asheville. There was this little brewery that opened up over in Waynesville. It's called Smoky Mountain Brewing Company. And I heard about these people, and I called them up, and I said, can I come over and talk to y'all? And they said, sure, come on over. So I kind of thought, you know, this is going to be in downtown Waynesville, and this is going to be a little, you know, walk-up um, operation in downtown and, you know, storefront kind of thing. So I followed these directions, and it, it was kind of odd. It was taking me into the residential neighborhood, and, uh, and I pulled into somebody's driveway. <laughs> and I thought, this is wild. So I went in, and sure enough, the Smoky Mountain Brewing Company basically consisted of a card table and a couple big plastic tubs and some empty beer bottles and a capper and a couple of dudes who uh, were from Cleveland, I believe, and they loved their beer, and they decided they would make beer. And craft brewing was still fairly new in those days. Uh, there were some major brewers that were starting to pop up, like uh, Sierra Nevada and uh, Boston Beer Company. They make the Samuel Adams brews. Uh, but there, there was nothing happening locally in 1993. So I did this little story. And then later, a place up, up downtown, it was called Chickadees and Rye, and it was uh, where the beer garden is now. And they were the first place to really have any uh, imported beers or some of these uh, you know, craft beers from Sierra Nevada and Boston Beer Company. And we thought that was pretty cool. But we just couldn't have imagined what was going to happen. And it really all started in 1994. And um, a dude named Oscar Wong, uh, came in here from Charlotte, and he'd been a retired uh, engineer. He, his career had been in designing waste systems to contain nuclear power, waste from nuclear power companies, and he'd sold out his company in Charlotte, and here he was, like 55 years old and retired and didn't have anything to do, and so somebody in Charlotte said, hey, why don't we start a brewery? And, uh, you know, Oscar has this funny saying, and he says, you know, if you want to if you want to get, make a small fortune in the beer comp business, you start off with a medium-sized fortune. <laughs> because because, because the, the beer business is really not one that makes a whole lot of money. Maybe I'll sit down here for a second if that's all right with you guys. Um, the beer business is a great way to go broke if you don't know what you're doing. But Oscar, where he didn't really have any brewing experience, he did have some serious business experience. And he hooked up with a brewer, uh, actually two brewers, 
and uh, they opened up the Highland Brewing Company. It was in the basement of Barley's Pizzeria and Tap Room over on Biltmore Avenue. And uh, Barley sold the beer upstairs and Highland made it downstairs. They were separate companies. But that's really where it began. And I was fortunate enough to be there the day they turned on the brewing equipment at the Highland Brewing Company. I say I'm kind of like the Forrest Gump of beer because <laughs> I tend to show up whenever these things happen. You know, I don't know whether it's dumb luck or genius or what. But anyway, that's... Uh, that's how it all started, and uh, we went from having stuff like Miller and Coors and Killian's Red, and we all thought that was pretty good stuff back in the day. But uh, now we've got 10 craft breweries in Buncombe County. Nine of them are in the city of Asheville. One is in Black Mountain, and two more are getting ready to open in the city of Asheville before the year is over with. The Altamont Brewing Company will open, finally start making beer over in West Asheville on Haywood Road. They opened about a year ago. It's just a tavern. And then yet another brewery, the 12th, will open over next to the Orange Peel on Biltmore Avenue. They're called Wicked Weed Brewing. Now, that doesn't include the big ones that are coming into the market. And you all may have heard that New Belgium Brewing Company, which is a major, major brewery from Fort Collins, Colorado, and uh, Sierra Nevada, another huge brewery out of Chico, California, are both building big breweries here. Uh, Sierra Nevada's brewery is going to be out near the airport, r literally right up next to the airport property. And the um, New Belgium is going to be down on the riverfront in the River Arts District. And between the two of those breweries, they're going to bring in more than 300 jobs, paying an average of around $40,000 a year, which is pretty good money. And I, mean, I remember when there were three people making beer, beer in this town. And, and right now, currently, there are a couple of hundred people who are making a living working for one of the breweries, doing one thing or another. A lot of those people are working as like servers at the Lexington Avenue Brewery, or they're uh, working as uh, in the pizza or the delivery or the serving uh, s set up at the Asheville Pizza and Brewing Company down here on Merriman. But, you know, I, this is going to be like 500 or more people working in, in, for breweries in Asheville. It's just... Um, it, it's just unbelievable for me. Uh, but let me get back to how Highland Brewing Company got started. Well, it, they started cranking out this beer, and they really didn't know what they were doing that, that much down there. I mean, uh, the brewer had worked over in Charlotte at a little startup brewery over there, and but this was something brand new. And nobody knew whether anybody would buy craft beer. They'd pay a few more dollars to, to have some locally made product. Um, but uh, the first couple of batches did not come out the way Oscar Wong wanted them to, and they flushed them. I mean, they flushed thousands, tens of thousands of gallons of beer down the sewer system. They had to call the sewer system and get permission to throw this stuff away. And finally, the third batch came along, and Oscar told his brewer, you find some way to make this work. I'm not throwing away any more beer. And, and they did. And they started off with a draft-only product, and uh, it was called Highland Celtic Ale. And uh, that same beer is still available in Asheville right now. It's called Highland Gaelic Ale. They had to change the name of the, the beer because another company had the rights to the name Celtic Ale, and so they changed it to Highland Gaelic. But it's exactly the same beer. It's the flagship beer of the Highland Brewing Company. It's sold in, I believe, nine states now around the country, uh, all over the southeast. And it's sold in, um, in tr six packs like any other craft beer. Is it Highland Brewing Company is the biggest of the breweries around here. They make 30,000 barrels of beer every year. And they sell their beer uh, just, like I said, all over the southeast and, and in draft and bottles. And uh, I think that's, the southeast is about as big as they want to get. They're not looking to become the next Budweiser or the next Sierra Nevada or Samuel Adams. They're happy to be in, in just in the southeast in these states that they're operating from. But, you know, it's always fun for me. I go down to the beach, go down to Charleston or Savannah with my wife, and you go into a restaurant. There's, there's that same beer that I left behind in Asheville. And it's always just that connection. It's kind of like a hometown connection that you get when you go out and you find something that's made here. But after Highland Brewing Company got open, uh, a guy named Joe Eckert came into Asheville, and uh, he opened up uh, a place called the Laughing Seed Restaurant and the Jack of the Wood, uh, which are over on, in downtown Asheville on Patton Avenue and Wall Street. And as part of Jack of the Wood, he decided he wanted to have a little brewery in there. So the Green Man Brewing Company became number two on the scene. And then uh, the, uh, something opened called Two Moons Brewing View over on Merriman Avenue. It's now the Asheville Pizza and Brewing Company. And uh, a guy who was running a company called Asheville Pizza came in and took it over, and uh, it became Asheville Pizza and Brewing. But it's the same basic format. They've got a movie theater over there, a pizzeria, and they've got craft beer. 
And then just one after another, the brewery started opening up. And I'll see if I got a list of them here somewhere. Um, French Broad Brewing Company, they began, uh, the guy who started off the Green Man Brewery for Jack of the Wood, he left and started his own brewery up. Then Pisgah opened up, up in Black Mountain. And then Wedge opened up down in the River Arts District. And then I was, I was getting a little crazy with this. I thought, you know, four beer, four, we got about four breweries going in here. I thought, maybe I can write a column about the beer scene in Asheville. And I went to my editors at the newspaper, and I said, what do you think? you think there's a beer column in there? And they said, you think there's enough to write about two times a month? And I said, I'd write this column every day if I didn't have anything else to do. And you know, little did I know that that was probably what I was basically going to wind up doing down the road in, in uh, 2012, because I'm trying to keep track of all these breweries has really become my major responsibility at the newspaper. Anyway, after... Uh, after the wedge opened up, we had Oyster House Brewing. That's in the Lobster Trap uh, restaurant on Patton Avenue. Soon to move up to West Asheville and expand. Craggy Brewing Company opened up in, in Hilliard. And Lexington Avenue Brewery opened up. The Thirsty Monk opened up its uh, little brewery on the south side of town. And that's the 10 that we've got right now. And, um, you know, this all just surprised me as much as anybody. I never figured it was going to be more than one or two when it, when it started off. And um, we started having a, a big festival in Asheville called the Brewgrass Festival. It was just last weekend. The first year that, that they had put it on, the first couple of years, they almost had to give the tickets away. And they lost a pile of money in Brewgrass. But uh, the organizers stayed with it. And now uh, Brewgrass is one of the, the best attended beer festivals in, in the country. They sold out 3,000 tickets to that thing in eight minutes on the Internet. And uh, they held back 500 more tickets that they sold over the counter down at Barley so that local people would have a better chance of getting it. But now uh, Brewgrass tickets are becoming, like they've become the hottest ticket in Asheville. Um, none of the breweries in Asheville have failed so far. That's pretty amazing given that how many restaurants go out of business and other venues go out of business, businesses of one kind or another. The only thing that's come in close to a failure was the something called the Blue, the Blue Rooster. And it was um, a combination restaurant and a brewery that was operated as part of Highland Brewing Company. And they were located on Biltmore Avenue right next to Barley's. And they didn't go out of business because the beer was bad. The beer was quite good, but it was that they didn't really know what they were doing as a restaurant. And that's the problem when you run a, a brewery restaurant is, is that you have to know what you're doing making the beer and you have to know what you're doing when you're running a restaurant, and you have to know who your customers are, and if, you're not in, if you don't have a history of working in a restaurant business and can put 100% into it and know what you should be serving, you can go uh, belly up, and that's what happened to the Blue Rooster. But that's the, only, that's the only failure we've had on the beer scene. And people are always asking me, how many more of these breweries can we take in Asheville? You know, I mean, it's a city of 80,000 people. Per capita, we have more breweries here than any place in the United States. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? You know, I mean, per, per population-wise, compared to population in the breweries, that's we got more here than anywhere else. And people, people are constantly saying to me, don't you think that one or more of these breweries that are here now are going to be forced out by some of the new brewers that are coming in? I've said, well, there may be some that will fail, but it will not be because of the competition. Because, I mean, how many Mexican restaurants can Asheville sustain? How many pizzerias can Asheville sustain? It's, it really, if you're making a quality product, if you're making good beer and you're different from the other guy, uh, then you can stay in business. And that's what's kept the breweries all going. Every brewery in Asheville has its own little unique uh, personality, I guess is the best word to use to describe it. Uh, they, they've, like Asheville Pizza and Brewing, they got the movie theater over there. So people go down there, they either get a pizza or play in the game room or they go to the, the discount movies over there. And uh, Highland Brewing Company started off basically to, to be just a manufacturer. They didn't want to do a tasting room. They didn't want to do a facility. But they do have a nice tasting room out there now that kind of promotes what they're doing. Uh, it's out uh, in the old Blue Ridge Motion Picture Studio on the east side of town. And uh, Green Man was down at, at the Jack of the Wood. That was his own little Irish thing. They've moved into a, a production facility down on Buxton Avenue, which is about a half a mile from the Jack of the Wood down the, down the hill, down Cox Avenue. But every brewery in Asheville has its own little personality, and they make different kinds of beers. And th if you're doing something that's different, then that, that really makes uh, their chances of being successful uh, to really increases those chances a great deal. Uh, I counted up once, I counted up how many beers were being made in Asheville on any given day, 
and not including the specialty beers. There's usually about somewhere between 60 and 70 different beers being made in the city on any given day because each of the breweries have five, six, seven brewer, uh, beers that they, they put out uh, that they have available all the time. Um, let me tell you about Beer City USA. And people call Asheville Beer City now. This all started with is really kind of a, it was an online poll by this guy named Charlie Papazian. He's a beer writer out of San Francisco, an author written about beer for many years, and is generally renowned as pretty much of an expert on craft beer. He decided to do this little online poll. Uh, people vote for the city that they think has the best beer scene. What's the, you know? And, um, you know, it came down to a big, the first year, it came down to a big battle between Asheville and Portland, Oregon, which, you know, obviously Portland, Oregon is a much bigger city than Asheville, 10 times bigger than Asheville. And, and I, I, you know, I don't want to say anything about against the Asheville beer scene, but Portland has incredible beer scene out there, as does San Diego, California. Those are three cities that were in the real running for that first beer city poll. But Asheville surprised everybody by winning that poll, and it was very close and has won it now for uh, many, several consecutive years. I think this is, might have been the third year that we won that, uh, that title, or fourth year of Beer City. Fourth. It's hard for me to keep track on it after, <laughs> after a while. But, you know, I wondered whether it really meant anything at all to be Beer City USA. I mean, it was back slapping rights here in town, you know, and people selling their Beer City T-shirts and their Beer City, city uh, beer mugs and that kind of thing. But last year, I went off to Belgium on a beer drinking adventure. We spent 10 days in, in Belgium and in Germany doing nothing but drinking beer, which <laughs> took me some time to recover from, let me tell you. <laughs> but the, the first day we were there, we were off in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the country, Belgium, in this old you know, 19th century brewery powered by steam. And they had a little room in there where you could get something to eat. And some people were at the next table and wanted to know where we were from. And I said, we're in Asheville, North Carolina in the United States. Dude looked at me and he said, Beer City, USA. <laughs> I thought, well, you know what? That really got outside of Buncombe County, didn't it? You know, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like that's a real reputation. And whether you know, eventually, if Asheville is, loses that title, I mean, I think that we've gotten a lot of pride out of it. Uh, several years ago, after winning it, several years in a row, there was some thought that we ought to just uh, graciously bow out. But it's not our poll to bow out of. You know, I mean, it's not it's not run by the local breweries. It's run by this guy Charlie Papazian, and it's his. You know, he keeps Asheville in there, and then the voters make up their mind what they want to vote for. And uh, Grand Rapid, Michigan, tied with Asheville this past year, and uh, so it, 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 that gives them a big boost as well. Now, the next wave of breweries, as I mentioned, Sierra Nevada and New Belgium Brewing Companies are both getting ready to to build major, major plants here that'll transform the beer scene. Right now, it's all fairly small operation. Highland is the biggest at 30,000 barrels, but some of these breweries in town are making only about 1,000 uh, barrels of beer. And so um, the Sierra Nevada and New Belgium were both carefully recruited. They were each, they were located on the West Coast and had maxed out their production basically at each of their facilities. And they were looking for some place to come east, and they, they took a, it was a national search for both of those breweries. It took several years before they finally narrowed down uh, on Asheville. And uh, the uh, the governor and uh, local uh, business recruiters spent a lot of time with uh, both of those folks, both of those companies, before they decided that they would come into Asheville. I, I thought, well, maybe we'll get one of the two. I, I, there's no way we're going to get both of these breweries. And I was just stunned as anybody else when they both said, hey, we want to come here. And um, they will be, like I said, they'll be hiring a lot of people, uh, each of them about 150 employees doing all manner of things, average starting salary of about $40,000 a year, which is good money around here. And um, will they, those breweries um, have an impact on the local breweries? People have asked me that. There's one up in, uh, there's a third big brewery is moving into Brevard. It's called Oscar Blues, and they make Dale's Pale Ale. It's probably their best known beer. It was the first American craft beer in a can. And uh, they, they're out of Colorado. And they've already hired a couple of local brewers uh, f for, away from, from several, two of the local breweries. And uh, this was the big buzz last weekend at Brewgrass was Oscar Blues has already started poaching from the local brewing community. And the story I heard was, is they were offering these people, they offered these people $20,000 a year more than they were making locally to come. 
And, uh, you know, that's a hard thing to turn down, a uh, $20,000 a year raise. And we're probably going to see more of this. Uh, these companies will bring some of their own people in. There will be people who come in here because they want to work for the brewery. Some of these will be specialty jobs that you really have to know how to do so certain chores in, in beer making in order to do them. But other jobs will be things that people can learn on the job or can be easily trained for. And um, that's uh, th that's the big impact on the beer scene right now. And hardly a week goes by that I don't hear that somebody is considering to open another small brewery in Asheville. I mean, some of them uh, are, will not happen. Some of them will happen. Uh, some of them are going to be what they call nano breweries, where you have a restaurant that's going to have a small brewing operation on the side, basically sell the beer at the at the restaurant or the pub, uh, the Black Mountain Ale House has announced that they're going to do that up in Black Mountain. Uh, Blue Mountain uh, Cafe out in Weaverville is going to be doing that as well. There are others that are going to come along. Um, as I mentioned, Altamont Brewing Company will be the 11th brewery in Buncombe County. And I have a story that's in the paper this morning. I've left some copies out here that you guys can take a look at. The Altamont Brewing Company opened up 18 months ago calling themselves a brewing company, but they didn't have the money to buy, to buy the brewery. So, you know, they just opened up as a tavern or a pub, and these guys have scraped together the money, and uh, they spent about $200,000 on their brewing system. I was stunned at how, what a pretty system is. It's a seven-barrel system. It's a fairly large system, and uh, they will begin making test batches of beer later this month and hope to all they're waiting for is their federal permit to arrive. And in early October, they'll become number 11. And number 12 will be the Wicked Weed Brewing Company. Also, very impressive layout, very impressive system uh, over right next to the orange peel. Their equipment is in over there, and they'll be, they're piecing it together right now. And they're hoping to get that place open by the end of the year. And uh, that will uh, bring us up to number 12 in Asheville. Oyster House Brewing Company. They've, they've been working from behind the counter over at the Lobster Trap Restaurant. Very low profile, probably the smallest, certainly the smallest brewery, one of the smallest breweries in Asheville. And um, they've been working on almost a glorified home brewing system over there. A very nice home brewing system, but it's not a you know it's not a big a big layout. But they're moving in to the old Viva Deli location on Haywood Road. That's going to give us two breweries in West Asheville. I live in West Asheville, and that's going to be very nice for those of us locally over there to have a couple of different choices for for breweries. And West Asheville seems to be developing into its own little beer zone because you've got the wedge just across the river in the River Arts District, and New Belgium is going to be building down there. They're going to have a, a big tasting room and restaurant and entertainment venue, as Sierra Nevada is going to have a big tasting room and uh, entertainment facility uh, restaurant out at, uh, at their place. Oscar Blues, the Brevard folks, they uh, are going to be open before the end of the year, too. And uh, they eventually, originally they're going to open up with just a brewery, but they're going to build a restaurant and entertainment venue at Brevard. Currently, we've got, besides the 12 breweries, let's just say that these two new ones are online, there are uh, over 20 in Western North Carolina within an hour's drive of here. Most of those breweries are within a half an hour's drive of here. Now, that's just an awful lot of beer that's going on in the, mar in the market. And, you know, people wonder how much, how much beer I drink every day, and it's like, <laughs> you know what, I get boxes of beer that come into the office. And people, they, they, people I work with, they say, you know, it's like trick or treat. Can I have one? Can I have one? take them <laughs> you know my wife didn't want me bringing any more beer into the house we've already got boxes piled up at our house you know but I really I don't go out and drink that much I have a, I drink a couple of times a week and uh, then basically to sample different beers uh, occasionally for recreational purposes I'll drink some beer but you know it's just you can get beard out very easily and uh, it's uh, I guess that's not a bad thing or not particularly a hard thing to deal with um, the other thing I want to mention are all the products that are associated with beer that are in Asheville. And you think it's just, it's just you know, six packs or cans or whatever of, of beer that are being sold here. But there's um, one company in Asheville is making um, shampoo and hair conditioner and body wash. And not cheap either. You know, these are expensive products that sold at, uh, at uh, Green Life and Earth Fair and are sold now all across the country. It's called Brew Shampoo. It's really good really decent shampoo it's not the, like the old it was something that they made back in the 70s which was a really cheap product um, there's also a company that's making mustards from beer uh, several of the ice cream places ultimate ice cream and the hop have made ice cream by boiling down a particular beer into an extract and mixing, mixing it into the ice cream and um, 
Another company that's involved in the beer scene, and I'm writing a column for 1st of October about that right now, and it, it's, it's called the Riverbend Malt House. And you think, what goes into beer? Well, there are really only four basic ingredients that go into classic beer, and you know, water is one of them, and yeast is one of them, and grain is one of them, and hops is the fourth one. And those are the four that are it, under the old German brewing, brewing purity law. Those were the only four things you could put into beer. Now people put anything into beer. Pisgah up in Black Mountain, they're making a bacon beer right now. <laughs> they believe they, they've made cherry beers. They've made blueberry beers. There's a, they, somebody, Green Man Brewing, is making a peach beer right now. And, um, but the, the Riverbend Malt House is providing the grain that's going into some of these specialty brews. They've, they've contracted with farmers across North Carolina to grow barley and rye and wheat and then they bring it into Asheville and they have it in a warehouse off Brevard Road not far from the farmers market and they process it over there and then they sell it to breweries across North Carolina. It's one more little specialty ingredient that goes into beer and uh, one more way of uh, the economy being fueled by beer here. And, you know, I, I don't see any end to this. I think Asheville is going to continue to be, uh, grow as a beer destination. And if you ask me in a year's time, how many more breweries can we sustain? Well, by then we may have four or five more online. And I, I don't think there's any limit as long as the product is, uh, is, is good and it's different from whatever the other guys are doing. So now if you've got some questions for me, I'll be glad to answer them. All right. You come over to the mic so we can... Oh, now it is. There we go. Um, I do like beer, so that's not the issue, but you said that it surprised you how this scene has grown. How do you account for the development here, and why do you then think that there's no end to the possibility of this? As you said, we are a small place. Okay, well, we're not Greenville, South Carolina. And I'm glad of that. I lived in the Greenville area for five years before I came up here. I was a police reporter for the Anderson Independent newspaper, and I covered murders and crime and that sort of thing. I'm glad to be done with that. But uh, why we have, what makes Asheville special? It's, a, it's been a tourist town for 100 years. So there's a, there's a population of people that come in here. Initially, people had moved in here or were vacationing here that had had craft beer out on the West Coast. And there also, there is, um, so they, there was some interest in that product from the very beginning. Uh, as the breweries begin to build and the reputation of Asheville as a brewing destination, people became curious. Even people who are primarily drinking other beers, Budweiser, Miller, Coors, they begin trying to sample the beer scene here. So you've got, an you've got a population of people that are curious. You've got a population of people who, uh, in some cases, have got a little extra money in their pocket, can afford the quality product. There's also a big movement of eating local, buying local in Asheville. And uh, those are three things that I think went into making the, the interest, building the interest up here that we, you've got other cities, Columbia, South Carolina, down the road, they got no breweries over there. And I hear you've got a major university in that town. You've got nothing. Knoxville, I think they have one over there. And they have breweries open and close constantly in the, mar in the Knoxville market. So it really has to do with the population and, and the kind of people that are living here and the kind of people that are visiting here that has really helped, I think, a lot in terms of uh, sustaining the, the brewing industry here. Is Asheville offering any kind of a brewery tour? Yes, it certainly is. And there is a company called Bruce, Asheville Brews Cruise. And they started up a couple of years ago. And basically, it's a van. And uh, they've, now they've had to expand into like a full-length bus but they handle all the people. Uh, and they've actually started Brews Cruise tours in other cities based on the success that they had here. But you pay them about $30, I think, and you get on this tour, and they'll take you around to three or four of the breweries, get you behind the scenes, get you here, unless you can hear about how the beer is made, you can sample the beer. And they've done really well. They run that tour every day. And they've, they've had to, because we've got so many breweries now, they've got several different tours. They have a downtown tour, and they have one that goes to some breweries and another one that goes to other breweries. So you really have your choice of getting a around and um, I've t I took the tour one time it's pretty it's entertaining but I mean I take my own Bruce Cruise tour every every day you know it's like I know everybody in the beer business here so I can pretty much just walk in and, and try what they've got 
could you kindly elaborate on the beer tourism? How much revenue does it bring us? How many visitors come? Do you have a little bit statistics there? Thank you. You know, that, that's a story that I've done several times is beer tourism in Asheville. And the uh, Asheville Area Chamber of Commerce, uh, originally they didn't have any, they had no interest or um, they, they didn't have any touch on the beer scene here at all. And I would, they said, well, you know, we really don't break those numbers out. Uh, anecdotally, you can find people uh, at the breweries who say they've had visitors who come down from different parts of the country or even different parts of the world. Um, there's a store over on um, Broadway Street called, um, it's um, Brews and Ales. And uh, they, they have customers there who come in from all over the United States to buy beer. And they come in here just really to buy beer or to drink beer. Things like the Brewgrass Festival, the pe people come from all over the country or even overseas to that Brewgrass Festival. So it, I can't tell you that there is a particular number that we can break out to say we're getting you know, 10,000 visitors or 20,000 visitors, but the, the Chamber of Commerce changed its story on being interested in the beer scene, and they've got a whole page on the Asheville area uh, tourism page on all the breweries around here. And it's hard to, you know, it's hard to keep it up to date because, you know, what, you have nine breweries or you have ten and then next year there's two more. So there's a lot of people who do come in to, for, for tourism, but I can't give you a particular number on it. I've heard Oscar Wong say that as much as 20% of his revenue comes from beer tourism. That's one brewery, but uh, still, that's quite yeah, a it's an anecdotal it's an anecdotal number. figure, but uh, they do get an awful lot of visitors, and of course, their beer is sold all over the southeast, too, so people who are down in Mississippi or in Alabama or Georgia or even as far north as uh, the Washington, D.C. area, when they come in here, they want to see where the, where the local beer that they drink back home is made, so um, I wouldn't disagree with that number at all. Oscar's pretty plugged in. I mean, he's the real beer guy in this town. I had breakfast with him this morning. He's one of my best friends. We were, he, he went with me to Belgium, and, uh, or I went with him to Belgium, I guess I should say. <laughs> he organized the tour and uh, was kindly enough to uh, allow me to accompany the Highland crew over through, uh, through Belgium and Germany, and I want to go back. But that's a, real, that's a real beer culture over there. Did you give the Monarch <laughs> Any more questions? Okay. Why don't you come over to the mic? Well, my question is, what percent of the beer that's brewed in Asheville is consumed in Asheville, or, and how far out is it distributed? Okay, well, I would say that for most of the breweries outside of Highland Brewing Company, almost 100% of their beer is sold here in Asheville. Some of, them, some of the beer is only sold at the restaurants. For example, Lexington Avenue Brewery, you can only get the lab beer at the lab restaurant. Um, so uh, some of the breweries have started uh, selling outside of Asheville. They sell around North Carolina. Highland, as I said, sells uh, all over the southeast. And this is going to change dramatically when these new big breweries open up here because Sierra Nevada and New Belgium and Oscar Blues are not coming in here to make beer to sell primarily in the Asheville market or in the western North Carolina market. They're going to make beer to sell, be sold all over the eastern United States. So when these places get opened up, and by the end of, uh, I think, by the middle to late part of next year, Sierra Nevada will be open. Oscar Blues will be open by the end of this year. And then the following year will be uh, when New Belgium gets going. That, it'll transform Asheville from just basically the beer being sold, most of it, a great deal of it around here, to being all over the eastern part of the country. Are you a home brewer? And can you describe the home brew scene around here? An echo view, too. Well, you know what? I started off... I, me and a buddy back in, I guess it was about 1991, 92, we decided we didn't want to drink. We were sick of drinking Bud and Miller and Coors. So we started trying to drink, trying to drink some different beers. There really weren't very many different beers around here, but we were just ho you know, hoping uh, hope that we'd get one brewery in here. But until they came, we decided we were going to make our own beer. <clears throat> went out and bought all the equipment that we needed, the tubs and the, the uh, various ingredients that go into beer, and made several batches of beer. And what I discovered about that was is that, number one, if you didn't spend a lot of money on the ingredients, you weren't going to get very good beer out of it. I mean, you really do have to to ha put whatever you're going to get out of it has to have gone into it. And there are any number of uh, ways of getting started in the homebrew system. Sometimes you can buy these little 
kits where everything, all the ingredients are all prepackaged up for you and you just pour a can of this into a bucket and a can of that in and fill it up with water and, and you know, give it two weeks and hope that something will come out of it that can be drunk. I and mean, we blew up a lot of beer bottles. <laughs> you wouldn't believe, it. you'd hear those things go off like or like bottle rockets or something and go down to the basement and there would be beer all over the floor and glass everywhere. And, and finally, um, a couple of stores in Asheville uh, started offering and a couple of bars started offering some decent imported beers. And at that point, we thought, you know what, we're going to just give up the brewing business, and I'm just going to take that $30 or $40 I was putting into ingredients and just spend it on beer down at the Asheville Wine House and, uh, or at a couple of other places that were starting to offer good beers. And so I'm, I'm not into home brewing myself anymore, but there is an extremely talented and lively home brew scene in western North Carolina. There's a great club called the Mountain Ale and Lager Tasters Malt, and uh, many of the home brewers operate out of that. They have a home brew festival in Asheville every year uh, called Just Brew It. And I've judged that for, the, I think, the three years that they've had it now. And I'll tell you this, is that the best beer being made in Asheville is by home brewers. And that's nothing against the commercial brewers, but the amazing styles the, and the amazing breadth of variety of talent that goes into the beer. I, I, I can't even begin to tell you how much good beer and also how much bad beer is <laughs> being made by home brewers, just like myself a few years ago. You have to learn this stuff. You gotta have patience and you have to really understand chemistry and yeah, you know, work with it. But yeah, there's a, there's a killer homebrew scene here. And in fact, tomorrow I'm off to Kingsport, Tennessee, my hometown to judge a homebrew festival over there that'll include a lot of the local homebrewers here from Asheville. Uh, what role does the water play in the development of the industry here? Everything. You can't make beer without good water. And, you know, I mean, Western North Carolina has a great water source. And I, I think that was one of the big reasons that Sierra Nevada and New Belgium wanted to come in here was because there is a great water source here. So if you don't, if you have water that's um, somehow contaminated and has to be cleaned up, that adds to it the, the process of trying to make the beer. And uh, so for home brewers and small brewers and big brewers, if you, you, that great water source is just so important. You said almost 100% of the beers produced are consumed right here in Asheville. There are those, as the letter page attests very often, there are those in Asheville who totally disapprove of this. Perhaps they disapprove of all of Asheville's weirdness. <laughs> but I wonder, I wonder how you answer the people who feel that it's a sign <coughs> a sign of our decadence, our increasing decadence, that beer is so popular here? You know, that's an interesting matter unto itself. There are all kinds of people that drink craft beer in this town, not just the weirdos and not just the long hairs and uh, people like me who have no air anymore. But it's, uh, there's a variety of people who buy craft beer. Um, a few years back, uh, North Carolina had a strict limit on how much alcohol could go into beer. Uh, beer could only hold 6% alcohol. That was the law. This was going back to Prohibition days. Before, before that, it was 5%, and then somehow they got it changed to 6 Meanwhile, you could buy all this cheap rock gut wine that had, you know, twice or three times as much uh, alcohol in it or, you know, some bad booze in a liquor, state liquor store that had a lot of alcohol in it. But beer was somehow said to be, you know, dangerous. And, I mean, this argument about beer uh, destroying society has been going on for many, many years, and that's what, what led to the dry laws of, of the Great Pro Prohibition era. Uh, so, uh, you know, Asheville, Asheville's no different than any other place, is that there are going to be people, I suppose, who abuse alcohol. But most of those people, you know, there was this argument when they were looking to change the, the strength of beer, which they were able to finally pull off and raise the, the level of alcohol that could go into beer. And there were people who were saying, Oh, this is going to lead to children drinking this stuff. This is going to, you know, break up homes. So, you know what? The people, kids are not going to spend $18 on a, on a high-end bottle of beer down at Brews and Ales. It's got, you know, 13 14% alcohol. Well, then go get a bottle of wine for two or three bucks and do it. And, or they can go just buy a couple of six-packs of Miller or Miller Lite and drink it and get just as drunk as they could off of a higher octane brew. So I don't know that brew has is, is contributed to the weirdness of Asheville. I think that uh, it maybe it's just been, it's, it's possible that it's all just one part of a big puzzle. And that's a whole other topic is how Asheville got weird. Because you know what? 
Asheville wasn't weird when I came here in 1984. I mean, it was just it was just dead. You didn't have hippies down on Lexington Avenue. You didn't have you didn't have head shops, and you didn't have people playing their bongos and smoking their clove cigarettes and quoting poetry and that kind of stuff. And uh, that's a whole other topic of how what happened, how Asheville evolved into the sort of uh, <clears throat> odd little community that it is. Maybe it always had its sort of uh, unique uh, characteristics, but. Uh, I, I think beer is just one minor sliver of the of the weird scene here. Uh, I wanted to go back to the water issue and, and politics of water. So has there been much discussion within the astral brewing scene about the possibility of moving control of water from the town to the county or whatever group is trying to get control of it? Uh, you know, th I, that's... Um, that's a political and a community matter, and I don't know whether it will really will affect the, the brewing uh, here. Uh, hopefully, the, there'll be a strong source of water available for the breweries because you can't make beer without water. But everybody is using different, going to be using different sources of water for the breweries. Uh, the New Belgian people will be using one source, and Oscar Blues up in Brevard is using another one. And the Highland Brewing Company is right off the city water system. You know, and that was one of the reasons that they, they decided that they wanted to build here was because from the beginning it was a good source of water, and hopefully. Uh, uh, the cost of the water won't be so exorbitant that it will it will be prohibitive for smaller brewers to get into the business. But you do run through a great deal of water when you're making beer. Thanks. I think I read in one of your columns that earlier this year when Asheville Brewing began canning at least one of their brands, Rocket Girl, that that was being done by a Budweiser facility? And yeah, well, it's, it, let me correct you on that. Asheville Brewing Company is canning that beer on its own, but they do have a distribution arrangement that is to sell the beer through the Budweiser of Asheville, which is a dis beer distributor, one of the big beer distributors in Asheville. So Budweiser of Asheville has an arrangement, just as Highland has one with Skyland Distributing, right. and Empire Distributing handles French Broad beer, um, and there's an, another c a couple of distributors, smaller distributors. So Budweiser of Asheville is not canning that beer for Asheville Pizza and Brewing, but they are taking that beer once it's canned and selling it all over Western North Carolina. Okay, thank you. Uh, I know Highland bottles a number of different varieties, and now Asheville is canning Rocket Girl. Are there other brewers that are either bottling or canning or have plans to in the near future? There's a lot of talk about it. It's expensive. Uh, Pisgah Brewing Company and French Broad put out some 22-ounce bottles, um, you know, and those are hand-bottled uh, or, or with very small systems. Highland has the most sophisticated bottling system in, in Asheville, and they started off with, when I first, they first started putting beer in bottles, it was a real Rube Goldberg kind of device. I mean, it was a hose leading into a box and somebody handing a bottle to somebody else and somebody sticking it into a slot and somebody pouring, sticking the hose down in there and turning on the beer and then it would spill out everywhere and then they would cap it and put it into another box. And, and now they've got an automated system that will fill both their 22 ounce bottles and their 12 ounce bottles, but their specialty bottle for Coal Mountain Holiday Ale, if you guys have ever had that, they have a big uh, liter bottle and those are still filled by hand. Um, is then Asheville Pizza and Brewing decided they wanted to put in the canning line. And it's, uh, it's not a big canning line, but it's the only one in Asheville right now. And uh, I had lunch with uh, the owner of that place yesterday, and he was telling me that they're looking to acquire the Budweiser of Asheville can't get enough beer from them. They want three times the amount of beer that Asheville Pizza and Brewing is cranking out right now. And so they're buying another brewing system to put in down there on Cox Avenue downtown at the Asheville Brewing location downtown to, uh, to try to up the production of their, their, their brewing. Um, Highland has talked about putting a canning line in in addition to their bottling system. Eventually, I think they will go that way. I believe canning is probably the future of craft beer. The Oscar Blues people who are moving into Brevard, well, they were the ones who introduced it. They had a hard time convincing people initially that beer in a can was not going to taste like Budweiser or, or taste like Miller. I mean, that's what, that's what people know canned beer for is the big grocery store brands. And so... Um, the, that the success of that has led to a lot of canneries, uh, it's craft breweries, and we're going to see more and more of those in Asheville. Right now, if you want to, almost everybody sells something called a growler, which is a big returnable bottle that you go to the brewery 
they'll fill it up for you or you can go to some grocery stores that have them that have been filled up i personally prefer to go to the brewery and get it filled up myself if i'm going to get a growler because you wouldn't know then how fresh it is because you're not really sure how old it is if it's been in ingles for two weeks or three weeks and but it'll hold beer some of those growlers will hold beer for quite a while i've had some for months in the refrigerator that were just as good when i finally got around to opening them up as they were when they were filled up so you can get packaged beer in a lot of different ways in, in Asheville. But right now, it's just uh, Asheville Pizza and Brewing and Highland doing it on any kind of a big scale. Do we know, do we know uh, when Sierra Nevada and, and um, the folks over in the River Arts, New Belgium open, are they going to brew existing brews and just brew them here or are they planning to develop particular brews to represent the good, new operations? Very good, very good question and one that I've asked uh, the, both of these breweries, will they have some one-off beers that you can only get here? At their breweries out west they sure do and the people, I think the people at Sierra Nevada are uh, very intent on doing some specialty beers that will only be available in, in Western North Carolina at the tap room and won't be sold in bottles or distributed anywhere else. So they're primarily what they're gonna be making their big brands uh, for Sierra Nevada, their, their pale ale and for um, New Belgium, some of their fat tire and some of their other brands that are quite popular around the country. But uh, th th that'll be the ma majority of the, of the production that comes out. But you, you will see some specialty beers at these breweries that you won't be able to get anywhere except at the brewery. And that's really exciting to me is to see what, because uh, th for them, the brewers have got, there's two different systems. And, and several of the breweries here in Asheville have two different systems. Like Highland has this very small little pilot system. And they're making beers, Highland Brewing Company's making beers out there right now today you could go out there to the brewery tonight. You can only get them at the tasting room. If you haven't been out to the Highland tasting room, you like beer, you ought to go out there because you'll, you'll find all, all sorts of small brews that the brewers are just playing around, seeing what we can do with this, what can we do with that, how can we flavor a beer. Maybe some of them are going to eventually go into production. Uh, and uh, like their little hump spring ale uh, went into production off of the pilot system. But uh, so there are any number of small batch brews that you can get at the local breweries right now, and we'll just see a lot more of that as we come along. Can you give us an update on what's happening with the lab expansion and if they've found a new head brewer? The lab has not found a new head brewer yet. They have an assistant brewer down there um, who has been, um, they're still trying to get back on, their, on their, the ground after losing their brewer, Ben Pearson. Uh, it was unfortunate that Ben was, is a really talented brewer, but he had a problem had it with ownership and he, it was a financial disagreement over a contract and that d delayed uh, the expansion of the lab but they are still looking at I mean they've been making some progress on getting that room ready and I think we'll see more of that next door space to the lab uh, in, in happening in next in this coming year and I think that the lab ownership is taking its time to try to find a new permanent head brewer in the meantime, they're trying very hard to get some more unusual beers in. And last week they called and said, you oh, you need to come down and try some of the new beers we have. And I caught them at Brewgrass and they had some really nice uh, beers. They had a raspberry porter that I was really impressed with down there. And um, I mean, I like raspberry beers anyway, uh, or fruit beers, as long as it's not like, you know, pronounced sweetness in the beer, but from the fruit. But they, they, they've got some good beers down there and they're getting better and getting more stable again after losing Ben. Being a beer tasting connoisseur, what is your opinion of drinking beer either directly out of the bottle or in a glass like a mug? <laughs> ooh, ooh, we. Or you know whether or not bias. you should drink out of a plastic cup or it has to be a glass pint, you know? <laughs> okay, I mean, I always pour my beer into a glass. That's just the way I do it. I've always done it that way. And I like to have the, different, the, the right glass for the right beer too. And this is something that's very cool about the Thirsty Monk Pub down on uh, Cox Avenue downtown. Is, you know, all these Belgian beers that they've got, they've got a downstairs room at that, at that place that has nothing but Belgian beer, beers from Belgium only. And upstairs they got American craft beers. But they've got, in, in Belgium, they've got all different kinds of glasses that go with different particular beer styles and particular brands of beer. So they have that pr appropriate glassware down at the Thirsty Monk. So if you order this kind of beer, you'll get it served in this particular kind of glass. And you think, does that really make a difference? Yeah, it sure does. I mean, it, to me it does, and it, it brings out the flavors because some of these beers, this, is, this has been proven over hundreds of years of development of, of brewing and glassware to go along with it. Uh, will I drink a beer out of a can 
and I guess I have drunk. I mean, it, you know, for example, the, the new can product from Asheville Pizza and Brewing, I've, I've had a goodly number of those straight out of the can. I mean, if you're mowing the yard, you know, if you're coming back in, you want a cold beer. If you're mowing the yard, a can might be nice. And, and I certainly, at the ball game, I drank quite a few beers out of plastic cups this past season. But I, <laughs> I didn't have any glassware out there. So I'll go for the glassware every time if I can. I agree. Are there changes coming at the wedge? Changes coming at the wedge. I thought I read that some things are going to be changing at the wedge. Okay, well, the wedge building was purchased uh, after the death of John Payne, who owned that building and had the wedge gallery. It was purchased uh, a few um, weeks ago by a group of partners that include the guy who runs the wedge brewing company, Tim Schaller. So are they planning on making any significant changes at the Wedge Brewing Company? Tim tells me, no, they're not. They're planning on it still being the same brewery. They don't want to get any bigger. But that building down there is going to include some new things, and there's a lot of buzz about a, the potential for a restaurant to go in down there next to the Wedge building, and that'll just make that parking situation down there even more challenging. But I'm, hopefully they'll figure it out. Is there any possibility that there would be something uh, uh, invented that would allow beer to be uh, uh, sold in boxes of some, that some sort? I guess the, the effervescence might be an issue there, and that's why they do it typically in cans Well, beer has bottles. traditionally been sold in either in, in bottles or cans or draft beer in, in, in tanks. I've never heard of anybody talking about boxed beer. Um, it's certainly the best thing That's not anything I've ever heard of, but you know, <laughs> nothing that seems to surprise me anymore. Um, you know, in terms of, I think maybe the closest thing to that would be a growler that you would get a larger package of beer. Uh, for, for me, you know, once you've opened up a, a container of beer, you want to drink it pretty quickly. That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> Little lunch boxes. Mm -hmm. like. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, with a straw so you can sip. There you go. There you go. Take it with you to your desk, you know. Maybe take a little, maybe a little more mellow in the afternoon if you had a few beers that way. Um, I've never heard of anybody talking about boxed beer, but I wouldn't be surprised. Nothing seems to surprise me in, in beer packaging or people are always trying out new ideas. And some of them work and some of them don't. All right. Well, if that's it, I uh, appreciate you all listening to me a little bit. And... Uh, Yes. I brought, I brought a stack of uh, this morning's Asheville Citizen Times scene entertainment section. It's our new entertainment section. It replaced our Take 5 section about six weeks ago. Beer Guy column in there, so you can read this week's column if you want, care to do that. Mm -hmm.